And what we try to do is to get people with very different voices together, so different levels of the university and different experiences, and those that all were active in name of decolonization. And uh, looking forward to uh, hearing your discussion. And to Asia. Great. Um, so I'm moderating this discussion, but I'm not going to take up any time and just hand over straight to the speakers who will introduce themselves. Speak for five to seven minutes as with the previous panels, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, hi, my name is June. Uh, I'm actually no longer at Cambridge, so I graduated from HSPS in politics and sociology last year, and now I'm doing a master's in uh, refugee and forced migration studies. Um, so I'm here mainly to give a student um, perspective on um, decolonization as someone who was, I guess, quite involved in organizing around this topic, not just in sociology, but um, in the wider university. And so, though decolonization may seem like a very current conversation in Cambridge and in higher education in the UK in general, um, students of color and predominantly black queer students have been agitating for this kind of change for many years. From the, in Cambridge, from Smuts Must Fall, um, a kind of extension of Rhodes Must Fall at Christ College, to the um, relentless work of the liberation campaign, so the BME campaign, the disabled students campaign, um, to campaigns to divest Cambridge from fossil fuels investments and investments in arms companies. This kind of agitation isn't new. Um, it's been a long, it's been around for so many years. And one example that I would recommend is going to see the Black Hand Taps exhibition in the UL, because again, this resistance has a history. Um, I have to acknowledge that my own knowledge, most of what I know now, is rooted in the fact that I got to be in Fly, which is a network that was created by black women for black women and that was generously extended to other uh, non-binary people of color and women of color as a solidarity space. And so I think it's really important to recognize that um, resistance also has a history in addition to like institutional histories. And so from this historical perspective within this institution, for me decolonization is more usefully conceptualized as a critical orientation towards unpacking and understanding how the history of imperialism, colonialism, and racism has affected what we learn and how we learn it. And moreover, um, following on uh, Professor Collinson's talk yesterday, decolonization is what we might call a resistant knowledge um, tradition. It is resistant as a function of its history, so the history of decolonization as a historical movement in uh, the 20th century, but also it's founded on histories of student-led agitation. And so I'm just going to go through like a quick three point summary because I'm a student and I, I like these kind of um, conceptual clarity points. Um, so for me, a decolonial orientation comprises three main elements uh, decentering, destabilizing, and disorienting. So, first, in terms of decentering, um, I think it's really, really important to remember that decolonization is not about diversifying. Diversifying as a discourse assumes that everyone is on a level playing field, um, and then the aim is simply to increase the numbers, for example, of people of color on a reading list, the number of women on a history of political thought course, for example. Um, but decolonization is about epistemic justice. We want to decenter the white male universal perspective, not because it is false, but because it has been lionized as the canon of what is considered to be valuable knowledge at the cost of other knowledges and also at the expense of many bodies and violence over history. And so the decolonization for me, in terms of decentering, is about recognizing the silences that form what is considered essential knowledge today. And it's also aimed at rectification, so making right these gaps in our knowledge. Um, so for example, it's not enough to simply study Du Bois in a first year undergraduate sociological course, but also to understand why he has been excluded from so many years of sociology, um, in my experience, and the implications of that for how we learn about the study of society. Um, second, decolonization is about destabilizing. Um, and I think this is dials into discussions about reflexivity um, that were previously mentioned. But decolonization means being committed to standing on unstable ground. We have this tradition also in critical theory, but it's important to situate it in particularly coloniality and modernity. And so what this means is that we have to be constantly ready to be challenged in our beliefs. 
And I say this not in a simplistic way. For example, in the way that people who oppose no platforming fascists say that um, it's an infringement on the freedom of speech or expression and thereby neglects the ways in which such actions uh, reinforce structural violence. Um, but actually in a way that is constantly listening for these silences created in the scholarship that we have today. And it's important here to look towards intersectionality as a way of finding these silences and bringing them to light. Um, and also, moreover, as students, for example, working in Cambridge, we have to be careful of how we reinforce um, the colonial economy of knowledge production and also how we can work in solidarity um, as scholars of color with differences in our own backgrounds and also with other scholars in advancing this knowledge project. Um, finally, uh, decolonization is also about disorienting. So decolonization has to be disorienting in the sense of it has to be continually challenging and it also has to be challenging to the institution. Um, so a big debate on decolonization in higher education now is about co-optation. So not like the dichotomy of working within or without the university, but how to work meaningfully within our structured confines to like make substantive change. Um, in 2017, um, two black queer students were targeted by the uh, right-wing nationalist press in this country um, at this university after students mobilized in the English faculty to decolonize their faculty. Um, and paradoxically, it was only with this um, kind of national press <coughs> reaction that the institution was galvanized into, you know, committing to decolonization. It even addressed the question of decolonization at a open assembly in March in the UCU strikes um, when the vice chancellor said, oh, we care about diversity initiatives when asked about decolonization. Um, I say this because, again, history is important and we have to recognize that um, the institution's reactions will always be reactive and temporary, but we want to build, I mean, I would hope that we want to build a tradition that is resistant and that is here to stay. Um, because the effects of colonialism, imperialism, and racism have been here, like, are permanent on our lives and we want to work to be free of those. And again, students of color have always agitated for more, not just curricular change, but more people of color teaching us, more people of color in the institution, especially black students. We have always demanded to be respected and valued in a place that was not historically built <coughs> for us. And with the weight of like coloniality and whiteness on our shoulders, we live this resistance every day, and some of us mobilize in support of it. Um, these radical critiques are clearly a threat to Cambridge and are a threat to the structure of higher education as it is today. And so one worry is that as decolonization becomes a new black, as noted by Sisters of Resistance, Left of Brown and Jenny Rodriguez in a recent article, the institution will absorb it and kill it with the bureaucracy. And anyone who's like been involved in Cambridge whatsoever will know that the bureaucracy is the biggest killer of any <laughs> initiative. Um, and so basically I, I end with this, um, from this position of reflection that um, it's important now more than ever to remember that decolonization is a critical orientation. It doesn't end and it is an active process. And we can't allow decolonization to become a term that means everything and therefore nothing. <laughs> Thank you. the organizers for inviting me to this panel. I'm very excited to speak. Um, my name is Tanisha Spratt. I'm a fourth year PhD student in sociology here at Cambridge. And I have been involved in decolonizing since the beginning in the department. And it's really exciting to see how it's progressed because it started quite small and now I feel like it's, it's actually making headway and we're actually doing things, so that's great. Um, so I came to the department in 2015 with no knowledge of sociology really. Um, I'd never studied it before, I didn't really know anything about it. And we used to have these great coffee breaks in our attic, in our PhD space. And we would talk about theorists and authors that we're looking at. And a lot of people were talking about Marx, Weber and Durkheim. And I thought, okay, I know nothing about sociology. I need to start with Marx, Weber and Durkheim. <laughs> so I did. And then I wasn't dissatisfied. It was very, very interesting. But I thought, okay, 
that's my foundation. Now I need to look at medical sociology literature, uh, which is what I do. So my PhD project looks at the lived experiences of US patients with visible and invisible chronic diseases, and how their experiences of living with these diseases intersect with their racial, class, and gender identities. And so I thought, okay, now I need to read around medical sociology. And so I started reading Goffman and Foucault um, and Parsons. And whilst all of these, yeah, and whilst all of these um, theorists are really, really great and they're really interesting, and in many ways they really informed and continue to inform my research, there was something that was missing. And that thing was race and ideas of class and intersectionality. And so my background, I did my undergraduate degree in English and American literature, and I did my master's degree in North American studies. And so by the time I'd come to Cambridge, I'd engaged with black and BME um, theorists and, and critics, but in a different way. And so I started to kind of draw on all of that knowledge that I didn't think initially would be relevant to my PhD. And I found it really helpful in thinking about ideas related to social invisibility um, in particular. And when I say theorists, because I, I did my undergraduate degree in literature, I was also informed by the work of authors like Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison, who continue to, to really inform what I'm doing. And so I found that really, really useful, and particularly in relation to talking about lived experiences. And in particular, I started to think about how these ideas of social invisibility that very much relate to race and critical race theory, how they inform and relate and encapsulate the experiences of patients that I've interviewed now um, and that then I was interviewing, and in particular the patients of colour that I was talking to. And this is something that without that knowledge and without me engaging with that work, I don't think my work would be as good, and I'm going to kind of talk about that as well. But when I'm thinking about, when thinking about intersectionality, I think it's really important in medical sociology to think about how people live in relation to things that aren't just directly related to their illnesses because you're more than, than your illness, right? You also have experiences that are unrelated. And so a good example would be um, in Audrey Lord's The Cancer Journals where she talks about her experiences in living with and recovering from cancer but also her experiences being a black feminist lesbian poet and how all of these things kind of combine and intersect. And recently we had, um, we had a speaker that came to King's for a workshop and she talked about her interviews that she'd done where she, um, she engaged with people who had directly experienced racism. And one of the stories that she heard was about a black woman who had breast cancer who wasn't accommodated after her breast cancer. She wanted a prosthesis and it wasn't black. It didn't match her skin colour and that was really traumatic for her as a black woman. So I think it's really important to think about how all of these things kind of come together, and that very much informs decolonize, as I will say. Um, decolonization is a crucial part of addressing and relating intersectional experiences. Um, and I think it's important to say what we mean when we talk about decolonize, because this is a term that I think is largely, or I hope, is largely misunderstood, and that's why it still encounters resistance. Um, and that's something that we would, it would be great to talk about in the, the panel discussion. Um, because I think there's this understanding that when we say we want to decolonize the curriculum, it means that we want to completely eradicate white authors. And that's, that's fundamentally missing the point of decolonize. It's not about eradicating the canon. It's about making space for people that have traditionally been excluded from the canon. And in doing that, I mean, it's, when thinking about intersectional experiences, it's so important to do that and to make that space. Because, I, like I said, when thinking about illness, it's about more than, than just your illness, it's about your everyday lived reality in, in dealing with it. And that is very much informed by um, intersectional understandings that you have about yourself. And so, I think, with Decolonize, it's really... I, it, it could be something as well to do about with the wording of it. So, this is something I was going to talk about later, but I'll talk about now. So, when we think about Decolonize, it makes me think of how when we hear, when a lot of people hear phrases like Black Lives Matter, they think that you're saying only Black Lives Matter and not Black Lives Also Matter. And when you hear about texts like Rennie Ideologies, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, people hear you hate white people, and that's not the point. And so when you say decolonize, you want to decolonize the curriculum. Again, it's not about eradicating white authors, it's about making space for people of color that have 
been excluded traditionally and that is only going to serve to enrich our academic research and for me personally I wouldn't be as as good at, at my research and I wouldn't my research would be fundamentally flawed in so many ways if I didn't think about this kind of thing so decolonize I think is, is crucial um, so yeah and also finally, I just want to point out that we're all involved in this process. So like I said, I, I came to Cambridge as a black PhD student and I thought I have to go to Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Foucault. So it's not just that, it's not like students of colour are completely excluded from this process. We're all a part of the process and a part of unpicking what it means to decolonise. So it, it shouldn't be seen as this kind of split between people, students of colour and then white students. It should be seen as this kind of collective effort to together begin to decolonize the curriculum, which is crucial. So. Um, hello, I'm Lindsay and I'm working, I actually just got my PhD yesterday. I just <laughs> I need some slides, not because I'd like to lecture, but I'm doing sociology for art. So, which means I need to show you pictures, that's why um, I need some slides. So, I would like to highlight the intellectual process that is involved in the colonization, which actually uh, one of the most, I would say, um, serious consequences is the demise of non-Western intellectual apparatus. Um, there are recent attempts at rediscovery, like the Muslim founder of the social sciences, or you know, you basically can, I think pretty much you can find other equivalents in any cult, like, you know, a culture, cultures with strong intellectual histories. And, um, but I'd like to talk about, let's go back to the end of uh, 19th century and 20th century, what ha actually happened in the colonized areas. It's basically a, either a kind of fundament fundamental change of how you actually frame your history, or as the Chi in the Chi Chinese case, we were a little bit better. Like we, uh, our intellectuals had certain autonomy and then we chose from those Western paradigms how we reconstructed our intellectual uh, history. So, which basically means that because we have, we ourselves have discussed, discarded these intellectual uh, paradise, and um, that's the reason. Like, although there's a gap here, of course, because I only have five minutes, there's no time to elaborate the whole kind of sequences. So, you can observe a lack of concept derived from non-Western cases in social theories. One of the examples would be. In the 1990s, was very popular in American sociology where they used guanxi, which in Chinese means relationship, to refer to the kind of the line of um, social capital study in China, which I think is orientalization because why would you need another term for social capital or you know social network analysis in China just because we like the word guanxi? So and also, if you look at the development of sociology in, in you know non-Western society, unfortunately, we were struggling mostly to we were preoccupied with using a, a like West Western concept to explain the Chinese case. Like in the 1990s, it was very popular to kind of rediscover the so-called civil society or public sphere. You know, at that time also uh, Habermas was pretty popular and that's the reason why and and they trying to kind of discover the evidence of okay there was also a public sphere or civil society in late Qing dynasty so but unfortunately like this time this type of enterprise has gradually faded away that people start to think okay we probably should try to build our own theories as well but my approach would be um, to shift from the grand theories to the study of art, like to look for sociological explanations of artistic produ production and of a different type of art. So these would be a two contradictory observations which are equally right. But this is only because when you say China is the world's second largest art market means um, the total turnover. 
And then when you say China is periphery to the global art world, because unfortunately global always means Western dominate, so which means the Western fine art, which is now called contemporary art. Well, that's in China, actually, the dual <coughs> art world in China that exists. Uh, examples would be Iowa Way, that's a typical kind of contemporary art, which is not indigenous to China, but you know, diffused to the rest of the world. And that's what people usually call the global art world. And then there is this tradition that has been long in China, developed through a long history. I do not have time to go through that, but you can see the difference. So let's go back to, if we say we're looking for alternatives, we look at different type of fine art. And this is important fine art in China, which, is, which was mostly developed in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, that means 14th century to 17th century. And you can see that um, the, the composition of painting and uh, the way the portrait, the mountains and the trees are very, um, and they are not abstract in the sense of abstract Western art. They are also not realistic in the way of realism, like the in Western art. And then it gradually, at the end, at the turn of the century, the Chinese artists were like, "Oh, our art is probably not good enough, so we have to adopt the real realism, and that's the outcome." Also, we have introduced the Western art historiography which shapes our own understanding of how we do art because um, before the Western art history was introduced to China, there was no kind of the similar way of writing art history. It was not the way that you divided to uh, periodization, like a linear process from um, a certain like a period that like, developed to later and then you have this kind of um, um, certain cognitive matter that underlies this type of narratives. So I think a good way would be to retrieve the social models of artistic production through dialogues between sociology, art history, and sinology, because they have done a lot of research about how it was different and in the pre-colonization um, period of China. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. So one of the things I think we can do as we develop decolonizing sociology in the department is to continue to think about reflexively what we actually mean by the word. And also not to try to necessarily pin it down to one or two things, but to kind of, you know, have an evolving conversation about this. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to just provide some comments from my own work, uh, which is focused mainly on India, um, where I think the case of India is so different from, say, Latin America and so different from parts of Africa that were colonized. And I think one of the things that would, first of all, alert us to is not to homogenize colonialism as a historical experience. Because it looked very different in different parts of the world, the forms of power, the power relations, they, they look different. And therefore, the experience of colonialism, with all of the devastation and you know processes of extraction and the um, kind of destruction of local cultures that are involved still look very different. And I mean, one of the things I would say with the Indian case is that even within India, there's huge variation. So uh, when the British actually took power gradually through various forms of direct and indirect rule, they also established a very close link with existing dominant groups. Um, and a lot of these dominant groups were also authorized to speak on behalf of other particular communities, whether on the basis of caste or religion and so on and so forth. And so the field of power, the field of colonial power is a complex one. And for that reason, it gives rise to an equally complex field of anti-colonialism, anti-colonial thinking, anti-colonial resistance. Um, much of this anti-colonial resistance in many instances actually draws on what we're calling Western theory. So Marxism becomes a very powerful resource for a lot of anti-colonial movements. Um, we can talk about the limitations and the problems with a lot of these, but the, the fact remains is that the, the, the field of anti-colonial resistance itself is not homogeneous by any stretch of the imagination. Um, one of the aspects of anti-colonialism in India is that also a significant strain of that anti-colonialism is drawing upon cultural resources that seek to impose Hindu uh, dominance in, in India. So 
you know, we, I mean, I don't, can't go into the long history of how India and Pakistan came to be partitioned and the whole, you know, very complicated history of this, but the fact remains that it's one of the things that we, that, that's important to me as, as a scholar of India is to recognize the longer continuities in these forms of anti-colonial resistance into the present where uh, the Hindu nationalists have been in power for a very long period of time and are actually, uh, you know, have succeeded in altering everything from, uh, you know, the discourse about caste and gender and religion, the curriculum, uh, they're, they're undertaking an overhaul of society, basically. Um, so I think that rather than an unreflexive emphasis on imposition, I think we need, to continue, we need to start thinking a little bit more about the dual processes of imposition and absorption locally of ideas coming out of colonial rule. And that can extend to sociology, but it's a whole set of other political and, and intellectual resources. Um, and I think that sometimes we may, and I say this in a sort of, you know, sometimes in the Western Academy, the conversations seem very uh, limited in that respect. Because I think sometimes these complexities are, are shrunk into a more homogeneous field of colonial and colonizer, uh, which don't always read to me as being particularly sort of useful in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense that I'm talking about. So for example, I'll just give a simple example, is the inclusion of Gandhi as the sort of representative of Indian anti-colonial thought. Uh, I mean, how many people, you know, how many students who read Gandhi have even heard of Ambedkar, for example, who was his contemporary, who was actually someone who made a very powerful critique of the absence of caste and anti-casteism, anti-untouchability in Indian anti-colonial nationalism, right? So one of the Ambedkar's critiques was that India might be free politically, but socially it's as bound by oppression as ever before. So for Dalits in India, you know, the anti-colonial movement was actually a kind of false promise of freedom. You know, Dalits today remain still locked into um, occupations that have to do with what are known as traditionally polluting activities like scavenging, cleaning toilets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Uh, so there's, there's. So what I think what I'm suggesting is that we need to recognize actually that the ways in which we understand decolonial processes and the, the kind of thinking that we absorb around this may not always be what we, you know, it may not be so homogeneous. It, may, it might be that there are internal contradictions between these things that are not being aired or heard about sufficiently. Another point I want to uh, make drawing on Patricia Hill Collins' uh, talk yesterday was the importance of nationalism and nationalism as a crucial filter for these things. So um, the battle again, as I said, it's not simply anti-colonialism and anti-colonialism. Nationalism is a political field through which a lot of these things get filtered and, and the binary sometimes can m allow us to miss things like, for example, the ways in which the Hindu right of India appropriates decolonial thinking and actually puts forward a an imagined, imagined past that was free of oppression until the British arrived. So Western dominance and Western theory can be seen then as a kind of uh, an imposition on a society that didn't have these problems before. And so for a lot of Dalits, for example, Dalit intellectuals in, in India, you know, um, the, the Brahmin is the real, you know, Brahminical domination is the real antagonist, right? It's not necessarily colonial domination, or it's certainly the imbrication of the two. But if we miss one and only emphasize the other, we're really missing out, I think, on what a lot of subaltern groups are resisting and agitating about. You know, so what I what I want to say then is that I, I think this isn't merely an academic issue. I think it's it's a question of our optic in in the West, even around issues that we want to, you know, think about it, the, the sort of take on a, you know, decolonizing project, for example. So where, I mean, the question for me is that, you know, where does one look for political resources when we think about decolonization? And uh, how much are we looking to recover the past? You know, is decolonizing then suggesting that there is a past to be recovered in a straightforward way? And I would suggest that we should be very careful about these sorts of things because there are many political, there's a lot of, there are a lot of stakes in this argument that we need to be alert to. Um, whose past 
are we trying to recover? Who's recovering these powers? Which futures are we looking to? Where are these futures? And are, they, are we always going to, is, is a binary of colonialism, anti-colonialism going to help us think for those futures as well? Now, I suggest, obviously, there are. I'm very involved in the decolonizing uh, process. I, I, I understand. I think that the ways in which sociology has been constructed as a discipline, ignoring uh, thinkers like Du Bois, ignoring the colonial and imperial past and present, is, is a huge part of the problem. But I think that we this is opening the door to a whole set of other questions that we also need to take on board. If you want to have a really kind of honest accounting of the operations of power in the contemporary world. So that's it. That's me. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Just raises so many issues. I was trying to furiously take notes and I'm running out of paper. Um, but I just wanted to briefly comment on that and then ask a few questions and then we can open it up for discussion. Because I think what all of you did really well was to highlight both the potentials and risks of a movement like decolonized, particularly in a place like Cambridge. Um, and I'd like us to reflect a bit more on that. So our department has, as many of you know, been involved in decolonized efforts, particularly in the last year and this year, thinking about reading lists. Um, you pointed out, June, correctly, to the inclusion of Du Bois on the reading list and whether that's as an effort, whether that's enough or whether we need to have a broader, bigger conversation around the politics <coughs> of exclusion on reading this. Um, and I wanted to think a bit more also about the implication in global knowledge production, which Manali and Tanisha both of you talked about, and um, Lindsay as well. Um, you talked about, for example, the dominance of English language, but also in terms of the journals that we're expected to publish in. Um, yeah. So in, in terms of thinking about the implication in that kind of global knowledge production, another important link that then comes up is the marketization of higher education, um, which we haven't talked about too much yet, but I think we need to reflect on because that, I think, makes helps us to make the connections between the potentials and risks of a movement like decolonize in that um, when we're talking about marketization, we're also talking about, for example, students becoming new consumers. Um, students making certain kinds of demands, but then it also does very much feed into thinking about ref, def, um, the pressures of that, the pressures on academics, and how do we deal with all of that within that. Um, and just linking finally to the points that were made by Patricia Hill Collins yesterday about institutional transformation versus institutional reform, and I think this really comes to the heart of what some of us are trying to get at with this discussion. Um, thinking about whether it's institutional transformation that we are seeking through a movement like Decolonize, so do we just burn it all down and start again? Um, or are we talking about institutional reformation which makes lives more livable, especially the lives of those who, are, who have been historically excluded from such spaces? And I'm not necessarily suggesting that the two are completely separate from each other, so perhaps the two institutional transformation and institutional reform go hand in hand, but what does that practically look like in an institution like Cambridge? Maybe we can start with a reflection on that and then open it up for discussion. Who would like to go first? Quite a few questions. Well, well, maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we can think about institutional transformation versus institutional reform um, and pick up from there and then we can go into more discussion. Um, I think one really good example of that is the fact that um, decolonizing sociology has a working group. And so for people who don't know, um, lots of decolon <coughs> lots of work in decolonizing, like organizing, has um, taken place through working groups that students have, um, in sometimes in collaboration with sympathetic faculty, um, created within different departments. And so um, some of us on the panel are on the decolonized sociology one. Um, I'm on some, I used to be on some other groups. And so, um, the decolonized sociology working group, though, is unique in the sense that it's supported by the Department of Sociology. Um, uh, our head of department is like really supportive of it and has led a lot of actions, and also is very receptive to like the amounts of the kinds of reflection that we're doing. Um, but again, at the same time, it is an institutional um, framework, and it is taking place within the institution. And so when it started up last year, 
Um, I found myself thinking a lot about um, what it means, how to rebalance uh, these conflicting, or not necessarily conflicting um, objectives, but how do we not let the bureaucratization of it, like the regularization of it, um, remove the element of resistance that has to be a part of it, and resistance not for the sake of resistance, but because <coughs> any form of institutionalization will always like replicate <coughs> um, structures of power when the structures of power are still in place. Um, and so I think the working group was a good example of the way you can, um, the way we work is very democratic, it was horizontally organized, students, as an undergrad I had, um, felt like I could talk and had a voice <laughs> and could contribute my views just as um, a PhD student or a supervisor or a head of department could also contribute their views and things like that, like resisting <coughs> those institutional dynamics and also supporting like UC strike and supporting divestment, um, disarmament within the broader university is a way that those um, contradicting um, forces can be reconciled. And I also think it's in discussion like co-optation, especially by the neoliberal university, like my worst nightmare is if decolonization becomes, okay, we have three people of color on a reading list now, decolonized, um, and it's it's truly nightmarish to think that. Um, I heard a terrible conversation where someone was like, decolonization is not political. Um, we don't know our view on the institution. And I was like, no. Um, <laughs> But basically, um, I think it's important to celebrate the successes that do exist. Like, three years ago when I was in first year, none of this discussion would have been possible. We would have been, we were shut out of every door, every supervisor was like, what are you even talking about? Like, these conversations could not have happened. Um, and it's all because of the pioneering work of a few um, really amazing individuals and movements that this is all possible. And so I think it's, it's important to like assess on balance like the benefits and the um, negative points. I think when talking about institutional change at Cambridge, and this is something that hopefully we can talk about in the next panel, it's important to note that the university is so decentered. And so when you're talking about institutional change, you have to factor in colleges, departments, faculties, all of these different things that together make up Cambridge. And so that, again, is something that would be really great to talk about because it's part of this kind of ongoing debate and this struggle. It's how do you, how do you make it so that these changes are effective in all the different parts of the university so that collectively decolonize can be associated with Cambridge and not just specific groups within Cambridge. So I know um, from discussions I've had with students that some departments like ours is, is a lot more progressive um, than a lot of other departments at Cambridge where you have subgroups of students who are really interested in these, these movements and interested in decolonizing and they just don't have the resources, they don't have the support from faculty, they don't have anything. And so that coupled with unsympathetic supervisors and lecturers who don't want to engage with students about these issues means that they generally have a really terrible time at Cambridge. And recently, um, I was speaking to a student who, I won't name her department because she's, I'm pretty sure she's the only black student in her department, um, but she was talking about a, an undergraduate thesis she wants to write, and she was saying, oh, I'm really excited about this project, this is great, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it because no one's gonna be interested in supervising me. And it was a really great project, and again, I won't go into details, uh, but it was a really great project, and I just thought, for this student, she's relating some of her own, and she's bringing some of her own experiences into, into her research interests, which is what we all do as sociologists, right? She's not a sociologist. But this is what we all do as sociologists. We all study things that are interesting to us, and that is often informed by our own experiences. And so for her, she felt like this project that she was really interested in, and that was informed by her own experiences, wasn't considered academic enough in her discipline because there was no one to supervise her for it. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's really important to think about how <coughs> institutional change at places like Cambridge and Oxford are different from other institutions that are more, what's the other opposite word, decentralized? Centralized, perfect, thank you. Yeah, that are more centralized. And so you can do things kind of 
on a bigger scale and not have to do things in pieces and bring it all together. Yeah, um, in terms of the like curriculum, like what do you say about if we have people of colours in the reading list, then we are decolonizing it. I think um, yeah, I think a lot of misunderstanding about decolonization comes from here because people of colour do not necessarily produce and um, you know, Eurocentrism is everywhere. It's not like it's only the white people that have this problem. It's actually um, Chinese people also have Eurocentrism and uh, our knowledge is totally Western oriented because like as um, Chinese we learned um, about Western societies and so on and so forth from an early age and um, but we don't learn about Latin America. We don't learn about Africa, not so much. So um, and also I feel that we need also to encourage more um, white people and I mean our parents like purely <laughs> colored so and I am also woman somehow. <laughs> so anyway, so um, I think it's important that they would be part of this as well. Like they would identify our kind of aims not as to um, like we have already said, to remove all these white names in the reading list, but really to um, try to go beyond Eurocentrism and all these uh, way of knowledge production. And I think that's the most important part. Yeah, I mean, I, I just a couple of uh, comments because I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, I, I think that the we have been talking a lot about curriculum change and wondering, you know, and, and this is in a department which is relatively open to it. I mean, as, as someone here mentioned, you know, there's some departments where this issue is completely shut out, you know, from, from any conversation. So, uh, I mean, this is a very old institution. Uh, Cambridge is, an, you know, I don't have to tell you that, you know that. Um, and to change mindsets is not going to be an overnight thing. I mean, I think a lot of things have to change. It's not just reading lists. It's also what people value, what kind of knowledge people value, what is seen as being okay to put on a reading list, and what is seen as okay to exclude. I mean, it's, it's so many kind of value judgments that are made along the way that it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take a lot of change. It's going to mean a lot of people have to leave in order for things to change. I hate to say that. Um, you know, um, I think, is that, is this been taped? Okay, I'm trying to. <laughs> Joe, edit this out. Um, but, that's, but that's partly the point, is that, you know, there are entrenched ways of doing things. There are reading lists that have not been changed for 20 years, you know. Um, so I think the, the model that we've evolved in, in sociology uh, is something that I think is very good to, tra to, to transport or whatever, you know, take to other places. And I know that anthropology are trying something like this, there's a discussion follows. So I think there is, it's, it's developing, but it's a long process. And along the way, I think there need to be a lot, of, lot more conversations of this kind. Um, and I think the second point really is to say that uh, it's important to remember that a lot of this is taken off as a result of student activism, student organization. And that is something that I think is not going to go away. And uh, that, if that remains, that pressure remains, that constant sort of mobilization remains, things have to change. Uh, so I think that's something to really remember. This is not a top-down, it's never going to be a top-down initiative. Um, there's too much resistance to that. One of the things I also truly appreciate about the student organization is the links they're making between decolonial de 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 thinking, theory, and practice, and activism around you know, issues going on in Cambridge or arms investment, you know, just really linking the political economy of this to class and race and, and, you know, so in a way it's not too expansive of a definition. What it's saying is basically when we think a particular way, this has consequences for real people, not just in Cambridge, but in, in <coughs> far, you know, far away places. We take questions. Shall we take them one by one or do you want to collect a few? Well, 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 <laughs> 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 um, I'm in the I'm a lecturer in the department and I've been involved in, in the decolonizing working group. 
And I was thinking some of the discussions that we've been having are around training, around workshops and learning. And what would a decolonial pedagogic practice look like? Because we, we think about how do we engage in a classroom. I think about it in terms of vulnerability, what does it mean to be a vulnerable teacher and a learner, but what would it, what would it be to decolonize our learning and teaching relationships? Um, you can talk about the learning. You can talk about the learning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. And actually that's an important point, is that actually we're all always learning. Um, and I think this dichotomy between, I've learned a lot in my few years here at Cambridge, and I've been willing to say that I have to keep changing. You know, and we don't actually, as educators, keep evolving our own practice, and the whole discussion is ridiculous, right? Because it suggests that actually we continue to do what we do, and then you know others have to change around us. Anyway, um, I mean, I think there are lots of there's pedagogy in the classroom. I just want to make a comment about the assessment as well, because the fact is that if Cambridge teaching is oriented towards end of year exams, then it just changes everything about the, you know supervisions. The, the, the lectures, everything's oriented towards that end goal. And I think to decolonize means you also have to take apart some other things, you know, about what we value in terms of what students do, you know, the kinds of things that students do at Cambridge, right? So for example, I mean, a lot of uh, student activists say that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's exhausting work. There's a lot of work being done that has no credit attached to it, right? So that's interesting. How's that happening, right? So it's it's basically, I think, just before we think about pedagogy in the classroom, we think, what is the pedagogy doing? What's around it? If we keep the exam system there, then I think what we can do pedagogically in the classroom remains relatively limited. You know, I mean, I think there are other people in this room are better positioned to talk about different teaching methods. I know Monica has, you know, done a lot of really good work around this. But, um, you know, I think just t thinking about these relationships between us and quote unquote those who are students, uh, just breaking that, that distinction down and from a traditional one to something that's a bit more good, kind of co-producing mm -hmm. knowledge could be a, a very different model of learning, you know, that I think needs to be looked at. There are all sorts of other things around training you know, around racism in the classroom and supervisions and exclusion of topics and stuff, which is just like, you know. Anyway, so, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I think for me, this is a question that um, I need to think about if, uh, about my future job, if there is any. And um, yeah, so, um, because you know, um, I, I learned at sociology uh, at the Agara in China, and our education was basically totally um, your subject. So I learned uh, what, what we would um, know, like, okay, the three most important, Max Weber, and unfortunately, Max Weber had this terrible question say, capitalism, why capitalism did not develop in China? Okay, so, um, yeah, so we started with this kind of question setting that, you know, in politics, we probably talk about agenda setting is more important than, um, sorry, achievable. <laughs> the other times, but so question, it's so research question is so important, and so we our mind would tune into that way that it's difficult to be diverted again to um, another track. So what I would think fundamentally, I think students need to um, be um, like need to cultivate critical thinking. I think that's the most important thing. Like when you think you are critical enough, can you even go further? So I think, I mean, my personal experience is like I, I obtain this critical attitude towards knowledge, towards power, through the reading of Abordo, which is a Western thinker, of course. But um, so I think, um, for me, I think if in the future I'm going to be uh, lecturing students, I would really um, um, point more to a more kind of critical approach. Like from the very beginning that I think students need to know um, um, you know um, to doubt to to like constantly contest your own own belief or I would say like Karl Marx always reminds us the condition of production like the knowledge production I think is the same same similar mechanism 
person that we always need to think and where does where do our knowledge come from? I'm actually part of the same subgroup as Tiffany, so I've had the same questions. Um, so this is really great for me because I'm learning, but yeah, I don't have anything concrete. Um, I think, so this is kind of drawing on my work in a less sympathetic department. Um, I think one of the things is that Cambridge, this particular context of Cambridge, um, a big emphasis is on critical thinking and intellectual integrity. And I think there's a way to um, subvert that and use it against them. So it's not intellectually honest and it does not keep with intellectual integrity to not acknowledge legacies of colonialism and imperialism on um, the social world as we know it today. It just, it just is wrong. Um, so the way we kind of played that strategy was to, um, not in terms of pedagogy, but in terms of demanding more from our educators was to say that we know intuitively we being those students who are organizing and predominantly students of color who are organizing. We know that something was wrong. We know that we need to trust our intuition. We know this from um, feminist theory, particularly black feminist theory. We know that we, our lived experience is telling us that we need to, um, we, there is something missing. And so we, <coughs> students organized with this intuition in mind and in order to, um, Know, write our own reading lists, uh, uh, make our own reading groups, all these things that basically push the institution to realizing that our intellectual projects are valuable ones and important ones. And if they didn't recognize it, then we would just do it anyway because we could give ourselves a better education than what we were being given. This was the, a lot of the discussions that um, I was lucky to be a part of. And so, in terms of like looking at how I wish I had been taught to think more critically, I think I wish that um, my experiences had been more listened to, but also that my educators and my lecturers and my supervisors would have been more uncomfortable, been more comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think there's an arrogance to academia that causes that once you have attained a certain number of positions or written lots of scholarly work that somehow you're an expert and you cannot be questioned and nothing ever, anything ever says will, you know, contest your theory. Um, but what we wanted was just more humility, I think, and with that, more criticality from the people who are teaching us. Um, and it's my hope that, like, future educators will also <laughs> do the same for their students who are struggling. And it was like a very difficult um, struggle to get a lot of these movements off the ground on the part of students. So, you know, what I was thinking that something that I think we can do, we or I've been trying, I think some of us were trying to do in the classroom, is to think about the relationships we create with students and to, to emphasize more relationship than content. And I think that can take us a lot further than just delivering content or trying to <coughs> even find ways for content to be delivered better. And <coughs> um, there's something, so if you think about the relationships, who's in the room, who are you, who's in the room, then you can use that resource to enhance our thinking in the room. Because I think many things just happen in the room, in the classrooms or in, in events like this where we don't necessarily see who we are. We don't see each other. <coughs> we don't take care of each other necessarily. I mean, there are many ways of thinking of that. From the timing, from if anybody is tired, should we be standing up now and having a stretch? Or, you know, are we thinking about <coughs> us as humans, or are we thinking of us as brains with legs, or brains with, I don't know, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think that emphasizing relationships is that, for me, that's where I would want to take my emphasis to decolonize sociology. And because it helps me think about my research, but also think about um, teaching the people. Yeah. I just wanted to add a quick thing, like um, Ali, who invited me to this 
panel, and Tanisha, who was my supervisor for two years, actually. Like, having them as my supervisors was, I mean, transformational, because I felt like, um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but it's true, because once you have teachers and people who understand you, teaching you about how to think about the world and validating your intuitions, like one time I remember I told you that some supervisor told me I should write more like a man, oh, which yeah. is something we always hear <laughs> as students. It's a very typical thing. Um, but Tanisha was so validating and she was like, don't listen to them, what are they saying? <laughs> like, but even just that, like, that was such a moment, like I'll remember that for a long time because sometimes it just takes that, like for students and staff to just and we saw this again in the UC strike and the solidarity between staff and students, but sometimes that solidarity is just in the classroom when you listen to your students and um, kind of create those meaningful intellectual relationships in a way that promotes um, critical Yeah, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I guess a, a contribution to the discussion, and maybe a, a very tangible thing. I'm from the US and I did my undergraduate at um, UC Berkeley. And one of the highlights was they have something called the DECAL program. And I think it's up for democratic education at Cal. And I'm pretty sure it, I actually don't know the history of it, it'd be very interesting. I think it's from the 60s. But basically what it is is undergraduates can teach classes to undergraduates. And it's for real credit. It's on the transcript. It's usually only one or two units and it's passed, not passed. Um, but they have a, a supervisor, but it's truly undergrads, it could be one, it can be a group, and they really design it entirely by themselves. They make the syllabus, and so that's maybe a very tangible way of, you know, so when I was there, it was on the criminal justice system and the prison, military industrial complex. We volunteered at San Quentin Prison. That was one of the requirements. We heard from prisoners, we had all sorts of guests. So that's just one example. Or I had a friend that taught a class on misconceptions of Africa. And they talk about MTV in Africa and fashion in Lagos, and it's all undergrad to undergrad. So just um, my whole personal contribution that there are models out there. I don't know if that's decolonizing, but in terms of leveling in the playing field of um, you know knowledge production, where yeah, if here in Cambridge undergraduates are you know organizing their own reading group, but that's not you know um, given any sort of credit in a formal sense. Now, I have no idea how that would be instituted at Cambridge, but I think there are examples out there. And this is a US example. I don't know about you know, the rest of the world. But. We have talked you. a little bit about, oh, sorry. No, no, you can. This is, we have talked about models like that. I mean, the Cambridge system is hugely more rigid than that. So you can't just keep adding stuff. You have to adjust everything to add one little thing like that. But we are, we are talking about having a much more kind of practice-based, um, kind of, uh, this, you know, yeah, component to the program. I, that's, I just wanted to make a small yeah, point, sure. I don't need the microphone <laughs> from that. <laughs> there were more questions. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, I was really interested in what you were saying, Tanisha, about um, bringing the work you did when you were doing literature studies, American and British literature, to um, the study of the sociology of health and medicine. Yeah. And I was wondering, what that means for decolonizing sociology, does it mean that we need to redefine what is sociology or who has the monopoly over the sociological and uh, redefining who counts as a sociologist? It's, it's interesting because I think that it's not something that a lot of people do. Um, <laughs> but I think that, so I have a student at the moment, for example, who um, she want, she's doing SOC 11 and, and teaching her one one as an exchange student. Um, and she wants to incorporate fiction into her sociological work. And probably after I talked about Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison, um, she was like, oh, that's great. And it's difficult because I, because I come from that background, I really see the ways in which fiction overlaps with sociology. So a lot of the time, authors like Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison will write about what they know, right? And what they know is based on their own experiences, and that is fundamentally sociological. So. I think that it's really important, and especially when thinking about medical sociology, because there's so much work out there that's dealing with narratives of illness experiences. It's like a whole subfield within that subfield. Um, and they really, they've been really, really helpful for me, and they're really useful in that they allow people who don't have the illnesses that they're talking about, or that are well, 
um, generally to engage with their experiences, not fully really know them because you, you can't know, but to understand them in a way that is useful in, in talking about. And so, for, for example, for me, with both of these say, look, I don't, I don't have either of them, but I feel like I can talk about them in a way that is better because patients have told me narratives. And often they'll send me things like poetry and, and different things like that, or diary entries that they've written um, that really, really help me to get at what they're saying when I interview them. So I think that there is definitely, or there should be room to, to kind of bridge the gap between humanity subjects in general, but, but narratives and literature and, and medical sociology in particular, I think that's interesting. That's a good question. Um, I thought that what Asya was asking about um, the marketization of education and how kind of those uh, broader structural conditions make decolonizing a more complicated project very important, because I think that um, one of the scariest processes of co-optation is if decolonization can become exclusively, even if it's not just three people at to the reading list, but if it can become exclusively about what we read in class and not about uh, the kind of material structures uh, that form our knowledge production, but also that link knowledge production to other things in the world. Um, so I wondered a bit about what you thought about uh, how decolonizing sociology can incorporate that. And I think it's a it's, it's further advanced in sociology, so for example, in if the UCU strikes, pretty much the whole department was striking and was involved in that process. Um, but also just constantly, so uh, for example, the, you know, the disarmament and the divestment movements have been mentioned, but rather than kind of saying that that's the work of students out there, and then the decolonizing sociology is to do with the curricula in here, how can they be continuously linked? And how can we always be thinking materially? And uh, I'm just gonna use this moment to conveniently plug that there's a <laughs> there's a there's a rally on Friday for <laughs> um, for demanding kind of a, a coalition of uh, multiple campaigns demanding the uh, the kind of divestment from fossil fuels, but also the arms industry, but also the ending of research and commercial research links with. Uh, fossil fuel companies and arms arms companies, and also ending the kind of revolving door of personnel that moves between high executives uh, of arms companies and fossil companies and high senior management here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's at the outside Senate house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my question very much follows in, in that spirit. I mean. Frantz Fanon famously said that decolonization is necessarily a violent phenomenon. And uh, if we think about the relationship between these student groups that are doing very courageous things, how confrontational can we be, or how courageous should we be when it comes to standing up for what is predictably, and we've already seen it in the course of uh, uh, the, ad the attitudes and behaviors of certain people very high up in the university administration reacting against the students. So how much is decolonization something that can remain in the classroom and about the curriculum and what is the relationship between that project and the kind of things that the students are doing and what is the responsibility and the, and the obligation of us as sociologists to, to be involved in this? They're linked questions, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, well, just concretely, one of the things that sociology decolonizing group has done is to have different, I know we don't want to bureaucratize, but we do have subcommittees. And one of the subcommittees is um, an activist and outreach committee, which is a bland title, but it's it, what it is is supposed to open or facilitate a, just a, a kind of two-way street between people who are working in different groups and you know activists working on issues like divestment and uh, so forth, zero carbon, and what we're doing in decolonizing sociology. It's really the beginning. I mean, I can't say that we're therefore completely involved or entrenched in all that stuff. I think it's just going to be a question of sort of figuring out what we can actually concretely do as a sociology department. And then there are individuals in sociology who will be doing that in other capacities, right? But I think that the larger point about connecting decolonization to material structures of investment and capital formation and and you know uh, you know investment in arms and other kinds of state projects across the world 
is absolutely vital. I mean, I think we don't have that discussion. It's just about ideas, and I think ideas are never divorced. They have have always. There's something, you know. There, there, there's a material base that that keeps them alive, right? So, yeah. I mean, but I think that. I mean, I think it's also important to recognize that a sociology decolonizing sociology group is is a group of a small group of individuals. It's not all the staff. It's not all the students. And we are, what we can do is just facilitate a discussion that recognizes the vital, vital importance of, of the kind of actions that you're doing tomorrow, I think, yeah. So, I mean, as far as Jeff's question is concerned, how, is, should we, how violence, we, something we should be using? Call, no, 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 I'm not thinking about using violence, I'm thinking about the kind of violent reactions. Oh, violent that, reactions. Yeah, uh, that are already we see them, you know. Yeah, yeah, we, we do, I think. You want to say something? Yeah, so I think I perceive the whole style attitude toward this term. Like people would say, um, thanks God that you don't use this word decolonization. <coughs> it's like, I think, yeah, so, so the, we were talking, I was, like when we were talking about what to talk in the panel, I was like, I think it's important to clarify. Like, I think it's a brilliant idea if you have a um, public outreach and then, and, kind of explain more why it shouldn't be uh, perceived as a um, threat. Kind of people would think this is a threat to um, the established, or it might be, or can be. <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, the, so I think, yeah, it's a brilliant idea to have the outreach department, so to say, to clarify why it's actually, uh, it's, it's beneficial for both sides. I think, I think we, we should learn from feminism because we have come to the conclusion that feminism is good for both men and women. So we should also kind of argue that a decolonization is good for both the colonizers and, <laughs> you know, and us, maybe. Yes. Good. Well, I just wanted to add a couple of points to that. One, I think I disagree with that. I think it's good that it's a threat, and I don't think it's our work to make it more palatable for the colonizers. So I, I disagree with that point. But just also going back to the point that you raised earlier, so marketization of higher education, etc. what are the links that we are forming with other struggles that are ongoing at the university? I used to work in equality and diversity, and I do see a very similar risk of co-option of decolonizers has been done with diversity with institutions taking it over. And I went to a reading group that a couple of people are here who were also present there. Um, and one of the things we were talking about was what are the things that the institution is willing to give to us and why is it so easily giving it to us, right? And I think in, in the sense of then going back to some of the conversations that we had earlier about how decolonization is a process, I think in that process it's really important to be alert to what is the institution easily willing to give to us and what it, what it isn't easily willing to give to us, um, and kind of constantly reflect on that and be aware of that really. Uh, yeah, I agree, like, decolonization means nothing if it's not a threat to the institution, because the institution of Cambridge and higher education in the UK and any kind of other um, site of structural power is going to be resistant. Um, and it's embedded in histories that have, like, I, the institution was not built for people um, like me, but especially not for other more marginalized students. Um, and so it's a militant um, <laughs> movement. And, um, you can see from the students who are involved in decolonization that they are the same students who are involved in all the other um, forms of action. Mm -hmm. And um, it's because we identify connectedness between our causes. Um, and yes, it is. Um, <coughs> I'm also thinking about how um, any kind of decolonization action can be um, connected to these more radical actions. And at the moment, it looks like the only way is to just plug events and um, <laughs> get our friends to um, participate. Um, but I think it's important, uh, one of the things that a very wise person once said in a speech about decolonization <laughs> was, we will take this institution and we will remake it. And this is the, <laughs> this is the ethic for me of um, decolonization. Because again, we have to remember, like decolonization still centers the colonial is decolonized, but also it's a recognition of that history and 
um, trying to rectify that history. But the rectification, there's a poet, if we're talking about literature, um, who says there is a danger to um, wanting to, there's a danger to restoration because you lose the cracks that um, create an object. And I think that uh, basically my convoluted answer is that we need to keep working on this aspect, but it has been, I think, a big part of the movement so far. Yeah. I think there's a comment by Monica, and then I know we have a few more questions, so we'll take that up to your comment. Monica. Yeah, just wanted to, thinking of that, I've been reflecting a lot of my position as this university race equality champion on the one hand, and then trying to do this other work in the classroom, and then being in the community. And, and I'm just thinking, I think it's an exercise, right? I see it as, a, as, a, as, a re, as an exercise where I'm trying, and we are trying different things, and kind of testing different avenues. So, so I went in to that arena of the institution to try to like, help for change. And we'll talk about, well, I don't want to talk about that, but uh, it's institutional change, the next one. But, you know, and I, I'm thinking, am I being a, a selling myself to the institution or no, or what? But then I think it's a very dangerous situation because we are the institution as well. So where do we put ourselves reflexively? It's always a question that we need to keep making, I think. So when I try to say, I, I try not to say they are not letting us, or they are, it's like, well, what are we doing? But it's, it's difficult because at the same time, yeah, we have power and we don't have power. And we are part of a very powerful institution, and at the same time, we suffer a bit the institution. So I think it may be like Trisha was telling us about this dance, you know? Uh, maybe we are doing that dance and we are in between these different fields, but, but noticing that, at least noticing it's a good start and just thinking where, that we cannot just be in one place. It's difficult, and it's, we, we can, but it, we can try, but it's very difficult because we play different roles and which one is the best, you know, that's a kind of, oh, and I think trying, it's, it's good. Um, so there was something that I think has been mentioned several times by several people on the panel, which is the idea of like critical thought and critical education and that kind of stuff. And this is something that was kind of raised yesterday. Um, is like, <coughs> what, does it, what does it mean to be critical, right? And that's like, historically bounded, geographically bounded, is bounded by like what discipline you're operating in, what is what qualifies as critical thought in sociology might be very different from what qualifies as critical thought in like organic chemistry or whatever, to take an extreme example. Um, and so like I'd be interested to hear the point of view, particularly like the students' point of view, graduate and postgraduate students' point of view on what it means for sociology to be critical and how we ensure that we maintain that critical focus and um, how we, because uh, I, I kind of think criticality is kind of like an onion, like it has layers and you peel them away and you, like, you know, Marx in 1848 seems like world shatteringly critical and then now we're like, oh, Marx, you know, dead white man, like kind of boring, can't we move on from that? Um, because we've moved on and we've started to interrogate Marx's own critical thought with a critical lens and so on. And so how do we keep doing that in terms of developing the curriculum, in terms of developing our pedagogical methods and stuff? Um, when it comes to thinking about different experiences, I mean, there are things that people, that black and brown people are aware of just because they have experiential knowledge of living in the world as black and brown people. And so if you're talking about sociological issues that relate to ideas of, of marginalization and kind of racial um, ideas of what it means to be black or white or somewhere in between, and people have those experiences, and it's important that you listen to them, right? And you don't kind of think, okay, their experiences aren't centered on the canon so they don't really matter in a sociological way because those people know a lot of different things and it's 
it's a way, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning, but listening to these experiences really enhances our understandings of the topics that we're, we're talking about. There are things that we don't know because we don't have those experiences and we can't <coughs> relate to them directly. So I think in answer to that question, it's about thinking and allowing space for people who know a lot more than we do about certain things to, to speak. And listening is about listening. <coughs> so, my train is on my Um, for me, a big part of remaining critical has been um, learning my history and the history of resistance and many different forms of resistance. And I think, um, because again, kind of, kind of drawing on what I said earlier, um, we tend to think of these discussions as new and current and contemporary, but actually people have been saying this for a long time. Um, everywhere in the world there are new, there are, not new, there are texts, there are people, there are oral histories, there are so many different um, forms of knowledge that we need to uncover in our archives and, um, and I think once you become conscious of those histories then it's very difficult to um, not become critical of the way that we know things now and what we know now. So, just knowing your history and knowing the history of the struggles of the people around you and how we can bridge those solidarities in critical thinking. Are there any final questions, comments? No? Then we thank the panel for the main traffic on